Today's Wednesday, August 21st, 2019, coming up on Roland Martin Unfiltered. Media mogul Byron Allen going to the Supreme Court with his fight against Comcast. He is basing upon 1866 civil rights law and why has the Trump Department of Justice sided with Comcast against Byron Allen? We will explain. Shooting near Clark Atlanta University on the first day of school. Four people were injured, two students from CAU, two from Spelman. We'll give you the latest details. In another case, a white kid is arrested for threatening to shoot up a school while uh, gaming with his friends and his white mama is just aghast at her son is going to juvenile jail. Yes, right. Arrest his punk ass. Wait till we show y'all the video. Tomorrow is Black Women's uh, Pay Day. We'll talk about why that's important. And also, I'm going to break down to you what is exactly what is the black experience. Of course, yesterday, you heard my commentary in response to Marcellus Wiley on Fox Sports. So, like, identity, the whole issue of identity and, you know, what's really black and who can really speak for black people. So, I'm going to break down this whole notion of the black experience. Plus, countdown to the final season of Power. We'll hear from Lorenz Tate. We call him the Black Benjamin Button. And, of course, Rotini talking about power. Plus, a memoriam to the former Saturday Night Live music director, Catrice Barnes. Folks, it's time to bring the funk. Roller Martin Unfiltered. Let's go. He's got it. Whatever the miss, he's on it. Whatever it is. CEO of Entertainment Studios suing Comcast and Charter Communications for $20 billion over racial discrimination. He claims that the companies wouldn't carry his networks or even meet with him because Entertainment Studio is a 100% minority-owned company. He also says the networks are in violation of the Civil Rights Act of 1866, which prohibits racial discrimination in contracting. The Supreme Court has agreed to hear the case on November 13th, and if Allen wins, it would be a major victory for black-owned companies and black media as well. Now, what's quite interesting about this is that this week, uh, the uh, Trump Department of Justice actually filed a brief siding with Comcast in this whole deal. So, in, according to uh, this, uh, this brief that they actually put out, uh, the Department of Justice, they are arguing that Byron Allen needs to prove that race is the specific reason as to why he has been denied an opportunity to actually have his networks on uh, on Comcast. He has blasted uh, the DOJ, blasted their interference as well. He said this is about enslavement. Pretty interesting. Let's talk about this, of course, with our panel. We've got a couple of lawyers on the panel. First off, uh, joining me uh, to my uh, right, uh, Puerto Rico's Driscale, a jump professor, adjunct professor at the George Washington University. Also joining us, Monique Presley, legal analyst and crisis manager. We have, of course, Dr. Jason Nichols, African American Studies. Uh, University of Maryland, and of course, and also joining us right now is Byron Jones, who's an attorney here in Washington, D.C. I'm going to go to Monique, uh, sorry, sorry, Ryan Jones, my apologies. Um, Monique, I'm going to go to you first. So, first of all, a lot of people were shocked when Byron Allen said, Civil Rights Act of 1866. People were like, okay, first of all, I didn't realize those Civil Rights Act of 1866. <laughs> um, but, it was, but it was very interesting, and people initially laughed at him. The fact that the Supreme Court is going to hear this case is has shocked a lot of people that it's made its way through the federal court system all the way to the Supreme Court, and they don't take a lot of cases. Right, right. But you know what? He's lived his whole career that way. He backs up whatever he's going to do with action. It's not a lot of talk. A lot of people have no idea even of how successful he is. Of course, you people like us know that being in the industry, but... Um, 
I applaud what he did. I wish that more people who were in the entertainment business who know good and well that, yes, he was discriminated against in this company was because of color. There was specific intent to do it for that purpose and that it wasn't for any other pretextual reason that they're going to come up with. It's a shame that you don't get the support of the justice system right now because, well, because of all of the reasons that I'm sure we'll find a way to talk about it. But I think it's a good step that the Supreme Court recognizes this needs to be heard. I'm not confident about what they're going to do, but I think it's a good step that it's being heard. Ryan, what's interesting about this, again, is the fact that um, uh, he filed this in 2015. Uh, it's now four years. It's made, made its uh, way all the way up. Uh, and so this is what the... Uh, this is what the Trump Department of Justice uh, said. Um, they said that although the statute does not expressly describe a necessary causal link between a plaintiff's race and a defendant's refusal to contract, the text is most, most naturally read to require but-for causation and background common law principles confirm that a but-for rule applies. Now, um, again, if you read the 1866 uh, Civil Rights Act, which is sort of, which is quite interesting, again, uh, something that was um, passed uh, in, by, by huge margins, uh, it was around one of the, uh, the Reconstruction Acts, 13th, 14th, and 15th uh, Amendment as well, uh, and it also established citizenship. And so it's really interesting, uh, again, looking at this and reading it. Uh, and what do you make, though, of Byron Allen using this particular Civil Rights Act? He's not saying, oh, you guys just wouldn't meet with me. He's literally using a law that was passed in 1866 as the basis of his claim. I think it's intelligent. What it does is it elevates the audience that's going to review the, the court that's going to review this claim. You take it to the federal system. That's how you get to the Supreme Court. He didn't go state. He didn't go local. He wanted to go to a place where he's going to have the biggest platform to speak his mind. And now it does call the conversation to us to say, hey, look, are we doing enough? How is it still possible for this to even be a conversation? Because you are a black-owned media entertainment industry, uh, company that you can be excluded from Comcast and getting your messages out to the black, uh, to na nationwide, black folks nationwide. And that's what Comcast is doing. Now here's what it says. All persons within the jurisdiction of the United States should have the same right in every state and territory to make and enforce contracts to sue, be parties, give evidence, and to, to the full and equal benefit of all laws and proceedings for the security of persons and property as is enjoyed by white citizens and shall be subject to like punishment, pains, penalties, taxes, licenses, and, and exactions of every kind and to no other. Jason, again, reading that, uh, what, what the law says is that, yo, black folks are the same as white folks. I should have the same opportunities that they do, which is what Byron Allen is saying. Absolutely. It's, that's exactly what he's saying. I, I really, you know, uh, I can't see how, you know, the, the Supreme Court and how the uh, how the Trump administration would go against that, but nothing the Trump administration does surprises me at this point. Um, I think we're going to, you know, see again uh, another example of how elections have consequences. And, you know, we see how the judicial element of, of elections and the consequences that they bear, um, not only in this case, but in even more serious cases around the country, not saying that this isn't serious, but in life and death cases. Right, but what's unfortunate, Roland, is that I, I, I agree in part, disagree in part. I think under a prior iteration of our Supreme Court, we may not have gotten or we're not likely to get um, a good result. That's why the fact that they're taking the time to look at this, and this isn't a case of first impression. We have the right to contract, and you're not supposed to be discriminated against in contracting. The reason it's so hard to prove is because people have the right to do business with whom they please. That's part of this free enterprise system. That's part of capitalism in the United States of America. So it's very hard. You can contrast it, same thing, to Colin Kaepernick's case against the NFL. Why isn't this person being hired? Is it because of race? Is it because of action? Is it because of protest? When you have to basically prove a negative, you, and that's what Alan's going to have to do here, show that every single other reason that they would claim is not true. And that's the only way that we get to the result where it is, and, it, and it's, it's really the, the benefit 
benefit, I guess, is that it's not a criminal case because really the standard's still going to be more likely than not. It's not like b beyond a reasonable doubt. So I, I think his case is strong. I just think that the court is reluctant to go into the waters of person's ability to contract or a company's ability to contract. Puerto Rico, what the, the, the DOJ says in the making of a contract, uh, he must establish that for the consideration of race, the defendant would have made the contract. Um, obviously, if you're Comcast, they're going to they're gonna say, look, we put TV One on our cable systems. Mm -hmm. uh, we have launched these other minority-focused networks, uh, Aspire, uh, there were a couple, a Clio TV, yeah. also tied to TV One. But, and so it goes on and on and on, which was a part of the agreement when they bought, um, when they bought Comcast, okay. excuse me, when they bought NBC Universal. Uh, and so that's one of the arguments they make, but the reality is, uh, Kathy Hughes had talked about this beforehand uh, at Rainbow Push, when TV One launched, they had to cut a deal with Comcast and give them an equity stake yeah. to do. Hmm. And that's been the case. Right, right. For, so a lot of these black networks, where the, where the cable, pro, where, the, where the distribution company said, okay, we'll put you on, but we gotta, have, we, we gotta own. All right. So you gotta give us an equity stake in your company in order for us to put you on our cable systems. Uh, and, and so what he is saying is, one, I'm not, I'm not giving anybody any equity. Right. Why can't you put me on these systems? And what we're talking about is, we're talking about, first of all, there were several other companies, uh, other cable companies that, that put his networks on. He's got a variety of networks, uh, comedy network, uh, um, a, a legal network, and several others. Right. Uh, and we're talking about significant amounts of money because there are cable networks out there who get five, seven cents per subscriber, and they, they are making a profit because they get that money every single month based upon the number of subscribers. I think what we are seeing what we have seen again is is this done over again right we saw this we certainly saw this during reconstruction with the whole concept of 40 acres and a mule we saw this during the the 50s i think the burgeoning of rock and roll with certain black uh, artists coming on the scene the, the rocket roar companies of course would steal and and say the same thing that you have to give us a buy-in or completely just give us shares of money where we could where we would turn over our copyrights right so we see this done over again, and I think what we're seeing now is someone who actually went through the legal process. I mean, we've seen others go through the legal process, but we're really seeing Byron take this through the legal process. And so I'm really interested in seeing how, what's the outcome, and not necessarily the ruling itself, but will others within the industry, media, as well as other minority businesses, take his example and go through the legal process to get what has been owed to them based off of discrimination? Ryan, well, we, again, we're talking about if he is successful, right. now all of a sudden, uh, the doors also begin to open. Because the way this system currently is, they are in control. In fact, I can tell you right now, we, we at TV One, it was interesting and in how these deals even work. You could actually sign a master uh, MSO, uh, master agreement with a with cable company that's national, but you still were required to go to each individual city and convince the local general manager of that cable, uh, of that cable affiliate to put you on their system. Uh, we had to get real uh, gorilla in Mississippi because the Washington Post owned a cable system in Mississippi, 70% black. And the general manager says, oh, we, no one here has requested TV One. And we're like, are you serious? So we had to, to take a campaign against them. I went on black radio there and said, all right, drop y'all cable, get direct TV. And then all of a sudden they responded because we also were on direct TV. But th those are some of the things, tactics that we had to actually employ just to get when BET launched, you had black preachers and others who had to bombard the cable system saying, put this network on this local cable system. And that's how a lot of the black cable networks had to operate uh, in the last 40 years. So I'm looking at what Byron Allen has done and what his lawyers have done in alleging the facts to make sure they have a claim that goes forward. Comcast tried to dismiss it. That's what you do. Someone files a complaint, before you file an answer, you file a motion to dismiss. Their motion to dismiss was, was granted. Now it's gotten raised all the way to the Supreme Court whether or not Byron Allen made enough, alleged enough facts to move forward 
in this litigation. In this litigation, he's still going to have to go and do discovery and find out if Comcast used race to exclude him. Mm -hmm. The Department of Justice's position might be, we don't want it to get that far. We don't want you going all through the emails of Comcast because it might come out that there was some racism that excluded But are you surprised DOJ is filing, filing a brief? Surprised based on what we know about this administration. You might not say, you would say you're not surprised, but you might understand that they're citing with Comcast and saying, yeah, let's just not let them go through this painstaking litigation that could come to say that they are, you'd have to say that they were racist. Monique, are, are you surprised that, that are you surprised that, I mean, here, here's, here's Byron Allen, Mo Studio, Comcast, Cable Network, DOJ filing a brief? Right, but we're looking at a civil rights claim, right? So it's appropriate for the Department of Justice to, and they're filing an amicus brief, so they're saying, we're not in this, but here's what we think about we're it. We're not and in it, but we're in it. And and that is appropriate, and, and there are many others who should do the same thing. The issue is that they're kind of bringing it down to some old, like, Dred Scott-type analysis on why this is not racism, and that's the part that bothers me, and and my co can my counsel here is is correct that he's going to have to start over at the beginning but here's the other thing when it's a civil suit money fixes it so he's not suing and even if he wins then they contract with him. They're never going to do business with him. The only thing that he can hope for is that they are crippled and exposed and shamed to the point that they are willing to work something out. Now, a settlement, sure, but courts rarely do specific performance. $20 billion is a lot of money, but it doesn't open a door for you or for right. me or for anybody else. Well, some of the other, some of the other smaller cable companies did buckle and put him uh, on their systems. Uh, Jason, uh, last point on this before I go to a break. I'm gonna be interested in seeing, will civil rights organizations file briefs supporting Byron Allen over Comcast, mm. who has financially supported many of these same civil rights organizations? Right. I think that that's, that's going to be an interesting Inquiry thing. Though? I think this this entire case is going to be interesting to see how it shakes out, how involved, you know, I, and, and again, I, I, I appreciate both of the comments from the lawyers um, because I'm not a lawyer. So it was very interesting. It is going to be very But you say the Holiday Inn Express out. so you can go ahead and speak on it. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, got to go to a break right now. Ryan, I appreciate it. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Uh, folks, when we come back, uh, what is the what actually is the black experience? What does that actually look like? We're going to talk about it next to Roller Martin Unfiltered. You want to check out Roller Martin Unfiltered? YouTube.com forward slash Roland S. Martin. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real. It's Roller Martin Unfiltered. See that name right there? Roller Martin Unfiltered. Like, share, subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's YouTube.com forward slash Roland S. Martin. And don't forget to turn on your notifications so when we go live, you'll know it. Four students were injured in a shooting near the campus of Clark Atlanta University last night. The shooting happened during a block party. The location was on the steps of a library used by Clark Atlanta University, Spelman, and Morehouse students. Here's the scene after the shooting. <laughs> Clark Atlanta University said two of the students were from Clark Atlanta and the other two were from Spelman College. Police said when officers arrived, they found four female students, ages 17 through 19, with injuries. They were taken to the hospital and are listed as stable. They're not in life-threatening condition at all. In a completely separate story, a Florida teen was arrested for making a joke about a school shooting while playing a video game. Here's, folks, what happened when the cops arrived at this white boy's home to arrest him. Okay. I, Dalton Barnhart, vow to bring my father's M15 to school and kill seven people. Don't remember saying that school, and Falcon Warrior 920? Yeah. Who's that? Mm -hmm. Okay. 
go ahead and turn around. Put your hands on your back. He's under arrest currently for making a threat to cause a mass shooting slash act of terrorism. Cause a mass shooting? Yes. He made a statement, a threat, a written threat to plan or to carry out a mass shooting. But he's just a little kid playing a video game. And all that's these kids so keep far. getting arrested. And that's why the FBI and the local law enforcement is spending so much time. Because how do we know he's not going to be the kid from Parkland? He's not going to be the next kid, the kid that shot up Sandy Hook. We don't know that. So when you withdraw the attention to you by making these statements as they may be jokes, uh -huh. I mean, I wouldn't expect a kid to go, yeah, I'm dead serious. I'm going to go shoot everybody up. No, uh -huh. when we're caught, it's a joke. I didn't mean it. It's a joke. Uh -huh. That's when you're caught. But you, 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 these games, these kids say stuff like that all the time. It yes. is a joke to them. It's a game. Guess what, so guess what wrong. My, my time in law enforcement game. is spent doing uh -huh. is arresting these kids for making these statements all the time and for stopping acts, too, as well. Okay. So that's what our job is, is to make contact, because these kids think it is a game or a joke, so they uh -huh. go ahead and make these comments. Uh -huh. But it's just a comment, so how is there an arrest? There's, there's a Florida State statute that says you cannot make a written threat to cause a mass shooting act or kill or harm anybody else. Uh -huh. Legislature has chosen to well, do that. Well, he didn't that. cause or yes. act or yes. do yes. anything, though. He made the statement, uh, too. It's a written statement. It's a written statement. It's a written threat to kill or to make a mass shooting or act of terror. So if I get on there and say, I pledge ISIS and I'm going to blow everybody up, that's the same charge as, you know what, man, I'm fed up. I'm going to go to school tomorrow and shoot up my school. All right, y'all. So that's, that's actually is a longer video. What is mama? Oh, my gosh. She's a, but he's a child. When they said, no, we're taking him to juvenile, she starts losing her mind. Jason, let's just be real clear. If that was me, my dad would say, hold one second, would have smacked the shit out of me <laughs> for playing a video game saying, yo, I'm going to roll up on school tomorrow and take some folks out. And here's this white woman with all her tears just, just shocked and then... Kids joke all the time. Hey, the cops said Sandy Hook, Parkland, Columbine, hello, uh, Santa Fe in Texas. What the hell are you thinking? So, so I agree that I, I, I see this in a nuanced way. Number one. What's nuanced? Uh, here, here's the nuance. Here's the nuance. Number one, um, when you start to think about zero tolerance, not saying that this was zero tolerance because he made a written threat, but there are lots of situations in which you have People, like, there was, of course, the famous case where the kid ate a Pop-Tart in, in a shape of a gun and pointed it at someone, and someone said it was a threat. So I, I think that there are situations where sometimes we go a little too far with the idea of what a threat is and what isn't. However, uh, this kid made a written threat, and I understand that's his mama. You know what I'm saying? Like, when, you, when the police show up and your mama's there, <laughs> your mama might be... Your daddy is different. Your mama... I don't I, no. I see her. I've seen... I've I know seen, some black mamas who would have smacked the hell out of his ass. <laughs> Maybe at the house in private, but I tell you, I could, I've seen a lot of mamas who have fought with the police Look, because their child was being taken. Quadricos, here's the problem I have here. There's a law. You cannot make written threats. Okay? They have to take this stuff seriously because they were criticized for ignoring right. previously written threats. You say in a video game, in a public chat... I'm going to go to school tomorrow mm -hmm. and bring this gun and take some folks out. And then the cops then asked her, ma'am, do you own a gun? She says, yes. yes he right. said, because she's like, oh, he's a little boy. Right. He right. won't do anything. Right. And he's, and my man, I, I'm telling you, y'all, if y'all had a full video, I wish we played. Because man, my man said, he got arms. Right. He got feet. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, well, guess what? He can go get, he the, can gun. get the gun. Right, exactly. Right. And, and the right. cop's like, yo, we ain't sitting here having this conversation. Right. And she's just crying. And them white tears are flowing. And these two white cops like, no, he going to juvie. So I agree with Jason's point. I think that certain situations are more nuanced than others. This is not one of those situations, right? What we saw and what we continue to see is, unfortunately, white people playing the victim, right? And here you had this mother. And I get she's a mother. She's defending her son. Rightfully so, but she's also playing the victim. She said repeatedly, this is a child, this is a boy, he doesn't know any better. He's 15 years old. <laughs> furthermore, <laughs> As if we a, have 15 right. year old shooters. Furthermore, that's a reflection on you. Right, that right. you didn't teach your son uh, the proper way. No, yeah, no, uh, brother, it's a right. Go ahead, go I get that ass. Go get in that ass. I would not. Go Ever have said or made such a statement, and particularly, no, I, I, I agree. But why blame his mother? Blame him. And He's fifteen. I blame his ass and his mama. Right. 
I think the responsibility is on both here. I was 15 at one point in my life. My mother would have never tolerated anything like that, right? And particularly, I think it's we have to be cognizant. We're living in a time right. where such threats. Wait, this, this are is Roland Martin unfiltered, right? So let's right? be very clear. No about shit. That. Really, did, you just figured that out. <laughs> did you? Did you? Did you smoke weed or, or drink alcohol as, as a kid? Oh. I, of I course bet your mom didn't want you to I do that, that question. But, you no, did. but the reality <laughs> nope. is, I was smart enough not to get caught. I was smart, <laughs> enough, I was smart enough not to break the law. And <clears throat> this young man and his mother should have been smart enough not to do the same thing. Oh, Monique. So interesting. I'm, I'm confirmed today why I'm the only one on the panel who's the defense attorney who would get called when somebody gets in trouble. Go ahead. Um, because, because uh, see, you would need oh, me. You would need me. You would need no, actually, me. actually, I wouldn't need you. No, but <laughs> right. His ass <laughs> plead. Okay. Uh, His okay. ass gonna plead. See, here's the thing. Um, this, this boy, and I find it interesting from black men who probably have a real problem with younger black boys being tried as adults in the system. Y'all, y'all okay with but that? But he's being tried but as now, a juvenile. This one is yeah. it because he's white that that no, he should actually, know actually, the hold up, first hold up, wait a minute. You saw the full video. The police officer explained to her uh, uh, that uh, it was a felony, but he was also going to be going to juvenile jail. Right. But go right ahead. And the reason why that is is because the frontal lobe is not fully developed until five years later, mm -hmm. and even later for men. Mm -hmm. I'm the only girl child on the panel, so I'll go, go ahead. and what it is. Um, and this mom is not the issue, white, black, or indifferent. If somebody showed up at my door and my child had been downstairs playing GTA and had been putting something in there, that child did not know that by I typing like, in oh, on yeah. that game that that was what's All considered right. a written threat in the eyes of the law. Damn that. Whether he, knows, Damn that. whether he knows he it's the, the law or okay. not. At least <laughs> okay. No, no, no. Ignorance My apologies. the law is no excuse. I'm it, not it, saying it, it is. not. Right. It's real clear that it's not. Right. But what I am saying is we have to inform our children. Which he did not do. When they're on these games and the black children and the white children and the brown children children and the blue children are all playing these games and are going to be held to these standards. The police officers were doing what they were supposed to do. This mom who's taken off guard by something she did not expect for that day is doing what she was supposed to do. I don't know if her tears were white or not, but I'm sure that I <laughs> they were. Been, I'm sure <laughs> they were. that I would have been taken off guard. I would have stood in defense of my son. I would have made sure his rights were being applied. I would have gone with him to the station. I wouldn't have wanted him to be arrested. Maybe I would have gone in the back and done whatever your dad or whoever's dad would have done, but not right then. I wouldn't but you have. Also, that's true. Hey, hey, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell y'all right it, now. It is oh. not on parents. You're saying that. Let me be real clear. You don't have children. <laughs> Let me be real clear. Let me be real clear. If that happened in Clinton, if that happened in Clinton Park in Houston, daddy would not have waited. Dad would, daddy would have said, what you say? What your ass do? You, Daddy wouldn't have waited till the cops left. And but, then he would have done everything he could to assist you because that's the kind of dad that you No, nah, I don't know, because no, my daddy made it perfectly no, clear. No, if you get your ass arrested right. on a Friday, see, I ain't coming till Monday. You right. see, I'm just letting you know. But, I, but he would come. No, he but gonna come, see, but he ain't coming that night. Life. Everything you hope this to is your where child, we're in agreement. I'm in agreement with you. No, you are. I'm in agreement. I'm showing up for my son. But yes. But oh, at the at child. the same time, my son at what, at five years old knows you don't yell. Hey, there's a bomb when we're in the line. Right. And at the, to. Right. At the uh, Has you know to. in the and, airport. And, yes. and, and a 15 year old should know not to make threats. Can't say that in his basement. Hey, what we do know is this here. Typing in public. These what we do different right. things. Here's what we know. You can't search certain websites. Here's what we know. We've had some 15 and 16 year old kids shooting up school. Right. And look. We cannot. I'm game. not done. Anybody want to talk we about We cannot Trump? play games. You, you can. When, when it comes these days right. to these kids who are grabbing guns, who are going to school, and it's not just the mass murders. Not just look. Yeah. It's not just. You just had what happened at LSU. You are seeing this. You are seeing where the mm -hmm. kid, uh, uh, what, the girl told him no going no, to the prom. Going, uh, right. That he's had to take her out or whatever the hell. And so, look, they're like, hey. We go, this is what the council said. We're going to sort this out later. Right. But for right now, his ass going to the juvenile jail, then we're going to deal with it. I got no problem with that law 
Because if I'm a parent, the last thing I want to do is sit, look, I got two nieces who are starting school tomorrow. And the last damn thing I want to be able to dealing with is some crazy ass kid mm -hmm. who playing the game, who issues, who, who puts a threat out there. And the people go, oh, he just 15, he a kid. And these little terroristic ass show up at school and shoot <laughs> up 15, 20 people. Then we go, man, why didn't somebody do something? No, they did their job. They, the law is what it's supposed to be. But as parents, we have to be informing our children and we have to be vigilant. And everybody got mad when Trump was trying to blame the video games for things. But this is a perfect example of something that is happening. And I do think that there is way too much violence going on in those games. And I hate it. And I try to keep all of that stuff out of my house. That doesn't mean that the kid without a gun couldn't have got it accomplished. So obviously, we need gun safety and gun laws, too. All I'm saying but, is, uh... Yeah. This ain't about that mama is all I'm saying. See, you have to no, add... No, we're, we're I, I, I think it's part... Final comment, go ahead. I think go it's ahead. part the, the mom, I think it's part the child. I think it's up to the parents as well as the students to educate themselves about the law. They, they have to know what times we're so living you wanna, in. You cannot you make statements like that. truancy and all that kind of stuff. You know like what? That's not a bad mama. idea. Lock up oh, parents. come <laughs> on, bro. <laughs> Why is it not? Hey, oh. hey, let me tell you something right now, y'all. This is real simple. You know why I didn't smoke or do drugs when I was growing up? Right. Because my parents... I wasn't scared people. of the cops. I wasn't scared of the cops. I wasn't scared of jail. I was scared of Reginald Lynn Martin Sr., who said, I will whoop your ass. And I was like, hmm, cops, daddy. You know what? Y'all can go ahead and drink all y'all want to, smoke all the weed y'all want to, because I ain't pissing him off. Because one day I was sitting on the couch watching the movie, and I looked over and looked at my dad's elbow. And I went, that's a big-ass elbow. And I looked at my elbow, and I'm like, that's twice the size of my elbow. I'm leaving this Negro alone. I'm just saying. So, look, y'all, we can sit here, and all this sort of stuff, bottom line is, yo, kids out there, don't play some stupid-ass games and issue threats. Don't, don't talk to your friends. Don't sit here and send text messages talking about, hey, I want to shoot some folks today. Uh, I wish I had a gun. I'm telling you right now, you're playing with fire and you're going to find yourself involved in the criminal justice system if you do it because parents have zero tolerance these days when you, all of a sudden you got 20 and 22 kids who've been gunned down uh, in uh, elementary schools and middle schools and high schools. No, we ain't doing no lockdown drills. We're going to lock your behind down before you grab a gun and go to the school. <laughs> All right, we come back. We're going to talk about the black experience after this break. Roland Martin Unfiltered. Hey, fam, I want you to like, share, and subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash Roland S. Martin. And don't forget to turn on your notifications. All right, folks, you heard me talk a lot about MarijuanaStock.org. Why? Because I want to keep you informed of investment opportunities that make sense. We've all watched the growth of the cannabis industry. A recent report by New Frontier Data estimates the global cannabis market at over $340 billion. We know that marijuana legalization is sweeping the country state by state. We also know that marijuana has a good cousin, the hemp plant, with a much higher concentration of CBD. That means hemp gives you all the medical benefits of marijuana without getting you high. Until recently, hemp farming was practically illegal in the the U.S. and heavily regulated by the DEA, but that all changed with the 2018 Farm Bill, making it legal to grow hemp CBD in the U.S., creating one of the largest commodities worldwide. Folks, they need land to grow all of the plants, and that's why this incredible investment opportunity uh, is before you, courtesy of our good friends at 420 Real Estate. Their business model is real simple. They buy land that supports hemp CBD grow operations and lease it to licensed high-paying tenants. That's right, they are hemp CBD landlords, and you can get in on the action. My friends at 420 Real Estate decided to do something special for the Roland Martin Unfiltered family. Originally, the minimum investment level was 500 bucks, but you can invest in this crowdfunding campaign for as little as $200. That's right, 200 bucks up to $10,000. This is a way for you to get involved in a $340 billion industry that is still growing. To invest, go to MarijuanaStock.org. That's MarijuanaStock.org. When you go there, it's going to take you to a, actually a crowdfunding page for this campaign. So uh, don't get uh, too alarmed by it. All right, folks. So yesterday, here in Rolling Martin Unfiltered, I did a uh, deconstruction of some recent comments by Marcellus Wiley on Fox Sports with regards to Colin Kaepernick and Jay-Z and Colin's girlfriend, Nessa, and Eric Reed and Kenny Stills all surrounding protests in the NFL and all sorts of stuff along those lines. And so the reason I was, so some people said, dang, man, you went in hard, because I was greatly bothered 
by what Marcellus had to say when he was talking about the identity of the individuals who were involved. And in essence, there was this whole notion that, well, Jay-Z is really blacker, really blacker than Colin Kaepernick because Colin Kaepernick is biracial and raised by white parents and was in Wisconsin, moved to Central, Central uh, California, as opposed to Jay-Z growing up in the projects there in New York. So for some of y'all who missed it, here are some of the comments of Marcellus Wiley, and then I'm gonna come back with my comment. This is an identity issue. You know why the identity of this movement has been lost? You know why the identity has been lost in this platform of kneeling and what does it really mean? Because the identity of those who are leading it has always been in question. Let's keep it 1,000 up here, because my past Ooh, is hot. My past <laughs> has expired for this. The past has expired. I've been going back and forth with this from day one at ESPN. Let's go. Kaepernick comes from a situation where he's never felt the full weight of these injustices. This is a mixed race guy who was raised by a white family from Wisconsin to Central California. Respect. That does not disqualify you from talking for us. But when you make missteps and miscalculations, oh, it comes back into play. And he never spoke on this when Black Lives Matters movement was at its height. Think about it. 2013, 2014, Ferguson, where, where Jay-Z is bailing prisoners out and doing protesters out and taking pictures and supporting Trayvon Martin and that family. What was Kaepernick? You know who he was? Taking his shirt off, bruh. He was, I knew Kaepernick back then. He was never talking about this. He meets Nessa 2015, all of a sudden, 2016, he gets benched, flip flop. Not mad, that still doesn't disqualify you. But Nessa comes into play now. And we all know Nessa. Respect to her and her ethnicity, but it's not black, okay? So now we got two leaders who don't even feel the weight hmm. of the consequences. So guess what you are allowed to do right now? Preach. Have convenience. Ain't no cosmetics here, bro. When I'm in Compton, when I'm in South Central and Harlem, that's my, my childhood to manhood, zero to 22 years old. Those three places, I know what it feels like. When you're talking to Jay-Z, who's been through Marcy Projects in Brooklyn and all his successes, he's seen this. We both said, go Cap or Nick, go, and let the cause blindly support the man. But the character is now coming to question. And then now Eric Reed is taking it and giving them cover. Eric Reed is taking Kenny Stills, another guy. Respect, guys. Another mixed race individual who's not felt the full weight of this. So when you want to take this movement, and I hate to play the race card against my own race. Usually you play the race card against the other races, right? But when I have to see these missteps and these issues all manifest, I get back to the identity of those who are leading it, which has always been in question. Mm -hmm. And now Jay-Z has answered that question. Let somebody who really knows what this is about handle it. So here's what's interesting with that particular commentary. And so allow me to uh, have part two of deconstruction. First and foremost, uh, Marcellus responded to that commentary by saying that uh, you got it wrong. I grew up uh, in Compton. I didn't grow up in Harlem. Well, actually, if you actually heard that comment, he said from zero to 22, uh, his life was Compton, South Central and Harlem. So that's why I included Harlem in that. And so, yes, Marcellus, you grew up in Compton, but you invoked Harlem, which is why I brought up the cases that took place in New York, which you were very quiet about when you played in the NFL. But see, if you listened closely to what Marcellus said there, he was saying that this whole notion that Jay-Z can speak to these issues more so than Colin Kaepernick can because of how Jay-Z grew up. Also, in the commentary, he talked about Jay-Z growing up in a public housing complex uh, there uh, in New York City and what he experienced and what he went through. Let me explain to you what that is. That's actually the code for you're blacker. See, in the 70s, what happened was if you were black and you were in school, they would say uh, you talk white or you talk too proper uh, where you come from. Then in the 80s and 90s, it was, oh, you, you one of them suburban Negroes. You didn't grow up in the hood. Now in the 2000s, we've now evolved now the whole issue of being biracial. So now we are criticizing folks and we're establishing the, sort of these levels of blackness. What has happened in this country, unfortunately for black folks who have fallen victim to white supremacy, who don't even understand what they are saying, is that we have defined blackness as actually meaning 
coming from broken homes, impoverished, public housing, rats and roaches, single mama, daddy not home, broke, destitute, and we had to fight our way to school every day and the way back home, and we made it through. See, that's how we literally define this idea of what it means to be black. I was in the Cincinnati Music Festival, uh, and that was a, a, a T-shirt. And it said, uh, I mix with hood and some other stuff. And somebody said, hey, you want that shirt? I'm like, hell no, because I ain't mixed with hood. Do you know why? Did I grow up in the Clinton Park neighborhood in Houston? Yes. The problem is, when you say the word hood, you left off the neighbor part. And so the word hood has now meant one thing in the minds of the person who you're talking to. See, the reason I brought these books out today is because we need to understand that there is no one black experience. This book here is called African Americans on Martha's Vineyard, From Enslavement to Presidential Visit by Thomas Dresser. Now, that's actually the black experience. Is that every black person? No. But it's also the black experience. Jill Nelson, Washington Post writer, actually wrote about this called Finding Martha's Vineyard, African Americans at Home on an Island. That's what this book is. This is also the black experience. I got a book right here. My man James Prince from Houston. Rap a lot records. The art of science and of the art and science of respect. Oh, he talks about being one of the baddest thugs in Houston and talks about uh, all the illegal stuff that he was involved in. Guess what? This is James Prince's experience. He talks about Fifth Ward and Third Ward in Houston and how he was one of the baddest cats on, uh, on the streets there. Yes, this is his experience. Is it the black experience? It's not. Here's a book called This African American Life by Hugh Price. Hugh Price, smart brother, led, eventually became the CEO of the National Urban League, talks about his African American life growing up in a household, family focused on education, him rising to major positions in corporate America, and then running that National Urban League. Very interesting book here called Negro Land, A Memoir by Margot Jefferson. She talks about being black and bougie. She talks about being a black woman of privilege and how she was raised and how folks saw her differently than other black folks. Guess what? That, that, that's also the black experience. Let's talk about W.B. Du Bois. Oh, the seminal book on black reconstruction. If you want to understand the black experience, you might want to read this particular book here. Oh, yeah, it's about 700 pages, but trust me, y'all can get through it. But he talks about, again, the period of reconstruction after the Civil War and talks about black folks in the South, also in the North, and what reconstruction meant for African Americans. If you really want to understand, talk about this whole idea of what's the black experience, well, a lot of black people who were critical of the civil rights movement because they said, oh, that's really the middle class Negroes who are really fighting this movement. So guess what? Uh, you had the editors of the book, uh, The Eyes on the Prize, Civil Rights Reader. Of course, he, uh, Henry Hampton had an Academy Award winning, excuse me, Academy Award no nominated documentary on, uh, on the civil rights movement, The Eyes on the Prize. Even during that movement, you had the back and forth where y'all don't really care about us folks who are sharecroppers versus y'all city folk. Uh, you heard all that sort of stuff going on, even though, guess what? Jim Crow was smacking uh, city folk and sharecroppers. But well, have y'all ever heard this book here called The True Story of America's First Black Dynasty, The Senator and the Socialite? by Lawrence Otis Graham. Oh yeah, it talks about one of the first black United States senators and how they had generational wealth, how they threw these exquisite parties uh, all uh, in the North in Washington, D.C. Yeah, it was called The Senator and the Socialite. This also is the black experience. Of course, Allison Stewart had her book on first class, The Legacy of Dunbar, America's First Black Public High School, talking about the black experience. Here's this great book that I also pulled uh, from uh, In Search of Black America, Discovering African American Dream, where this brother literally when all across the country, going to various black neighborhoods, trying to search for what exactly is black America. Then, of course, you have Isabel Wilkerson, who had her great book called The Warmth of Other Sons, won all kinds of awards, talking about the great migration of black folks from the, from the South to the North. That's also the black experience. Then, of course, uh, you have uh, this great book called Black Families in White America by Andrew Billingsley, the 20th anniversary edition of a modern classic by a preeminent Afro-American sociologist. What does it mean to be a black black family in white America. Then, of course, my man Gerald Horn, University of Houston, one of the top uh, historians out there, 
he really explains this whole thing in the book called White Supremacy Confronted, U.S. Imperialism and Anti-Communism versus the Liberation of Southern Africa from Rhodes to Mandela. If you want to understand where a lot of this came from, right here, White Supremacy. But why all of this is important? Why is my last book? Easy. Dr. King's book, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community, where he literally talks about where we stand as black folks and talks about the various experiences. He talks about the issue of poverty, talks about the Negroes, of course, uh, who didn't necessarily experience the same level of poverty, but they still experienced Jim Crow. What am I getting at? We are idiotic by continuing to allow individuals to play this game of defining the black experience as being one thing. There is no one black experience in America. Here we are this week celebrating or commemorating 400 years since the first 20 odd Africans arrived in Virginia in August of 1619. And in these 400 years, there have been numerous experiences of black folks. The reality is you can grow up in a black family, in a black neighborhood, and go to black schools, and go to black churches, and belong to black organizations, and when you become an adult, don't give a damn about black people. And you can be a biracial Af a person who grew up in a white family, who lived across the country and the world, and you know what? You commit yourself to the issues that impact black people. See, who else is actually having these silly ass conversations? What other groups are having these dumb ass discussions as to who really is more authentic, who's really more hood, who's really more black? That's how stupid this stuff is. I remember when I, uh, after I had pledged Alpha Phi Alpha, we were at a party and we had a brother who was from Sam Houston State walk up to me he's like, oh yeah, oh y'all think y'all some, this is exactly what it said because y'all don't, don't use the word, oh y'all think y'all some smart niggas because y'all go to Texas A&M. But see, but y'all, uh, this is how we do it at this school. I had a brother who was at Prairie View who said the same thing and they were talking all this trash and I said, let me ask you a question. What's your chapter graduation rate? Then they got silent. I said, oh, y'all ass can't talk? I said, see, you want to challenge me because I went to Texas A&M and pledged Alpha. And you went to Sam Houston State, not an HBCU. Another brother went to Prairie View, that is an HBCU. So you want to question my blackness and question whether I'm real. I said, when our chapter and our hitcher only had one brother who did not graduate, and he's not authorized to come to any of our events. I said, so let me ask you a question. What does it mean to be an Alpha? Does it matter if you go to a black school or does it matter your ass actually graduate and do the things that an alpha man is required to do? He got real silent. I even had a sister when I went to the Fort Worth Star Telegram. Uh, and, I, and I joked with her about today because I jacked her ass up when she said it. We were standing by the photographer's table and so uh, she was a sister. And um, somebody said, she, somebody uh, introduced me to her. She said, oh, oh, you the brother who didn't know who he was who went to a white school. I said, oh, really? I said, where did you go? She said, oh, I went to Southern. I said, oh, so what you're saying is you need to go to HBCU to figure out that your ass was black? I said, I grew up in a black neighborhood, black family, all that sort of black. I said, I knew I was black by the time I was 18. Now, when I talked about that one day, people, some folks who went to the HBCUs got real upset with me. But what they understand was what she was trying to do was denigrate me because I didn't go to an HBCU. And I said, boo, you can go to an HBCU and still be clueless about black people. Just like you can go to a PWI and be clueless about black people. The black experience in America is wide. It is diverse. It is broad. And what we have to stop doing is playing these silly games of questioning somebody's blackness. And what we should be asking very simply, are you doing the work? Are you doing the work? Now, I disagree with the people who call Jay-Z a sellout. Just like I don't allow people on my show to call black Republicans sell out or call them Uncle Toms or call them uh, Oreos, any of those names. Just like I don't let anybody come on this show and call somebody the N word or call them a coon. Because, see, that's offensive. But what we better understand is that we have a generation of black kids who are not growing up in hoods, a generation of black kids who are growing up biracial. So, what are we saying to them? by saying, well, you really don't have a black experience. That's not really a black experience. Well, what is it? Then when we use the phrases, you haven't felt the full oppression, the full weight of what it means to be black. Well, actually, 
how many people have? I mean, Marcellus went from Compton to the Ivy League school. I'm quite sure there were some black people who said, why you didn't go to HBCU? Oh, I heard that. I had a brother who challenged me when I was a senior in high school. I can't believe, see, that's my problem. All y'all Negroes are going to the white schools. I said, really? Where are you going? I'm going to TSU, Texas Southern University, which is right across the street from my high school. And you know what I told him? I said, that's interesting. The Texas Southern University has a school of communications, and they literally are right across the street. And I was actually named the best student in my high school in my four years there, and they never actually recruited me. I was across the street. I said, so I'm going to follow the money. Because you know why? My parents going to have three kids in college at one time, and damn it, I'm not trying to be broke. My brother went to a and my sister went to a and and I went to a and All three have graduated, all three are doing well, and guess what? We ain't got no damn student loan debt because it's all been paid off. But the point I'm making is that's the black experience. HBCUs, the black experience. Community college, the black experience. Growing up in South Central or Watts or Compton or Harlem or Lithonia or Prince George's County, that's all the black experience. But we are the only ones who are playing this stupid game where who can be blacker than the other person as opposed to what's the work we're focused on. That's why I did the commentary. That's what offended me the most. Because guess what? I would rather somebody who's biracial or somebody like Nessa who ain't even black, who give a damn about our issues, than a whole bunch of black folks who will turn their back and don't care and say it's, it's all about me, myself, and I as opposed to the issues at hand. Watch what you say around your children. Watch what you do around your children. Because if we are putting the wrong things in their heads, they're going to carry that stuff forth and repeat those things in school, repeat those things at church, repeat those things to their friends, and we have another generation of black folks who are questioning the blackness of somebody else. Y'all got thoughts? I agree with everything you said but I think you left out the black experience regarding Afro-Caribbean and Africans as well. Because Well, I didn't go to the diaspora. Right. I was only specific. I, was, I, I, was, I, perfect, I, I confined it to the 50 states for a reason. Okay. But because for me, I don't call that the black experience. I call that the African diaspora. That's it, why. It, but it, go ahead. And go it ahead. is. You're right. It, it, it is the African diaspora. But I think that once our brothers and sisters from the continent or for Afro or for the Caribbean move here, then they are a part of the black experience. Because to make this conversation a little bit more comprehensive, I am fatigued, very similar to this sort of Chick-fil-A and Popeye's debate, right? <laughs> <laughs> the, when, when brothers and sisters from the continent and for the Caribbean move here, none of us are privileged under the thumb of oppression. Because what we say, black Americans or descendants of slaves specifically say, oh, well, they're not black, right? Because they didn't grow up here, because they didn't have the same experience. And I'm fatigued by that conversation as well, right? Because the reality is when they get here, they are a part of the black experience mm -hmm. and they help to shape black identity across because blackness extends well beyond where you were raised or where you lived, right? So we have to think broadly about what blackness means, right. and it can't just be limited to black American right. experiences. Which, well. which, which is why I, 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 so I specifically showed the Gerald Horn book. Right, right. Because Gerald Horn in that book lays out how global white, supre white supremacy right. has impacted people uh, of color. Money, go ahead. Um. African American males in the United States are disproportionately stopped, searched, frisked, assaulted, uh, arrested, killed by law enforcement. Um, the number of decades that that's been happening extends to the beginning of this country. Um, the data of, of recent years shows that it happens more predominantly um, in southern poor areas mm -hmm. and in cities, in urban areas. Um, I have not felt the weight of that experience. Mm -hmm. uh, 
one, because I'm a woman, and the numbers show plainly that it happens right. largely to African American males, right? Um, uh, two, I've been fortunate enough to of women who have been in that position to not be one of them. Okay, so if I were to say that I haven't felt the weight of what the Kaepernick Neal was originally for, which was African American males who are being illegally targeted and mistreated and killed by law enforcement, then that would be true. And if someone critiqued me and my leadership, even though I'm a capable advocate, saying that wouldn't offend me. It doesn't mean that I don't have a black experience. It just means that I haven't experienced the weight of the original cause for which he took that knee and for which others are now still taking the knee. Um, and, and then the only other thing I would say is the only reason we have a black experience as opposed to an African experience is because a white man told us it was black. So every time I hear black, I tend to get mm -hmm. back on African because I know that black and white are not real races. There's just the human race um, that a few decades ago, white men in the legislature decided it was okay to transition us from nigger to Negro to black. colored oh, to great. right wing ni right. nigger colored, Negro, Afro black, <laughs> and, and then we... Afro-American, Afro -American, Afro -American, African American, right. Right, right. black and interchangeably, so I, yes. I think it's important that while we try to figure out who is and is not black, we recognize nobody is, but everybody is, because it's just a legal construct and a social, yeah, construct, a social construct that was put on us by a supremacist head. Uh, now, if we want to adapt right. it for our own, even though, Roland, I know you disagree about adapting nigger for our own thing. You don't like that oh, word. Oh, no. I ain't, we can't I, adapt I, it. I ain't, I ain't, I ain't in, adopting whatever in my that opinion, they had as oppressive. I ain't adopting. Y'all keep that bullshit. But in my opinion, keep... every time they put a color label on us, it was meant to oppress us also. So I choose to adapt my ethnicity and my country or countries of origin so that there are no issues with my Caribbean brothers and sisters, with my brothers throughout all of diaspora. I'm not with Eidos people. You know how I feel about that. And to me, anything else we do in this area that doesn't highlight that anybody who halfway looks like a black man is in trouble on the streets is just a waste of time. Well, I just, I just, I, 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 but, but the greatest, but the, the greatest thing that drives me crazy again is that we are, we, we are, we are having a conversation about who's blacker than actually the issue. That's what is fundamentally wrong for me. And I've seen this throughout my entire life. And again, I've seen how the conversation has shifted. And what does it say? What, is, what are we saying to somebody who's biracial? Oh, yeah, you're not, you're not really one of us. Oh, yeah, you might be fighting, but you're not really one of us. And see, that's the next step. And that's the issue that I have there. So when you start saying the identity of the person who's leading is in question, I know exactly what you're doing. And see, you, you also can't use the rhetorical devices of respect, respect. No, it's not respect because you're coming back with another particular comment, and so I yeah, know. Yeah, but I didn't mind him telling the truth of his experience no, and expressing no, 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 his opinion. No, 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 no. But here's my point. That's what we do. And that's my point. That first of all, we can give a lot of opinions. Yeah. But if it's also BS, you can get called out. Italians and wouldn't want to be am... led by non-Italians. No, 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 no. And they would ask you for your papers. No, no. no but here's 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 the piece. Though. No, you would have to prove it. You'd have to get he's, your genes right. tested. Guess or what? Whatever. Guess what? No same Italians. <laughs> true. When they yeah. bring their ass to Denver, all of a sudden they get sick, and then they go to the hospital and realize, damn, I got sick of cell. Guess what? Thank black people. But, but, here's but, my, but, but, but they here's, would here's, need the help rolling. No, no, no. But, but here, no, but, but here's you wouldn't my point, be though. Italian. I You'd just be helpful. But first of all, you can call Italian all day, but the reality is if Jesse Williams shouts his mom and daddy out, daddy's black, mama is white, the reality is Jesse black, okay? And Jesse also got a white mama. Because, because but, we said that. No, 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 no. Because no, we agreed on no, that. He's white, no, too. No, no, we also... No, he's I'm, white. No, no. I'm also saying, <laughs> no, I'm saying he's black and white. Yes, he his, is. his black daddy's sitting right there. That's what he is. But what I'm not going to do is I'm not going to penalize, no dismiss him by saying you ain't really black because your mama's white. He's half black. Right. And, but, the, but the point is, black. when we play this game 
Not of that. No, it is a game. We're playing that, but it's a it's game so because so if bad. that brother so is, if that yes. brother is cares about the issues, and is putting it on the line, dude, I'm gonna applaud that. But what I'm not gonna do is say, ah, well, but, you're kind of okay, but, but you're not. Go to ahead. Give you push back, Roland, on that notion. What about? Brothers like Herman Cain and Ben Carson doesn't right, matter. Who also who have the authentic again yes. authentic black. And I am going to they're di- black and, and, black. and, and here's a piece. Right, right. Here's a piece. Real, real black. First right. of all, Clarence, Clarence, John, Clarence Thomas right. is a black man from from, 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 from rural Georgia. Right. And I am going to disagree. What did I say? Is based upon what's the work are you doing? I am going to disagree. And I can. I ain't gonna say you're not black. Okay. What I am fair, gonna fair, say fair is. Enough. What I am gonna say is. The policies that you are espousing and promoting are going against the interest, not just of black people, but many people. When I disagree with what Ben Carson is doing as her secretary, I, I can be critical. I, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to call him a coon. Okay. I'm fair, not going to call fair. him an Oreo. I'm not going to call him a sellout. I'm not going to call him an Uncle Tom. What I am going to say is the policies you are advocating are wrong. Because guess what? If that was a white secretary of HUD, who took the exact same policies of Ben Carson, I'm going to say your policies are wrong. But what I am saying is when, when, when you have a media piece, when, when you use that platform and what we say and what we're sending out, when we set up this sort of test of who is blacker, and because he then what happens is some are blacker than others. No, 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 no. Here's the problem with that. No, here's the problem with that. Some are black no, and white. No, but here's the deal. Black no, no, but here's the problem with that. It doesn't matter. No, 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 no. Because the phrase, because the no, no, because the phrase of who's blacker. No, no, the phrase. No, follow me. The phrase of who's blacker is not dependent upon if your mama and dad is black. What they say is no, no, no. Your experience is blacker. What he what he's really saying is because Jay Z grew up in the hood in the public housing complex because he, he saw said drugs. All of those no, 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 no. What he he's said saying all is, of those what he's saying is that's blacker. And what I am he saying said is, all of those I am not going to define the black blacker blackest experience <laughs> based upon whether you grew up in a public housing complex. Because guess what? I didn't grow up in a public housing complex. I grew up in a black neighborhood that was specifically built by HUD in the 40s for black people. And you know what I saw? I could stand on my, on my porch and see the DEA and the, and the Houston police take down a crack house right there, five houses down, but I can look across the street and see a two-family house two-family uh, household raising their kids. I can see a single mother down the street. I can see an elderly couple here. We had all those experiences. That's fine. But Everybody no, but my get point. Along. No, no, but my point is, I'm not going to let somebody say, well, yeah, that was a black experience. But if you actually were in the CUNY homes in Third Ward, that's a blacker experience. I, got, I, I get and it. That's and that's the I, problem I, when yeah. we're saying what's blacker. I know, I know but I mean, and that's to BS. me, I know, but Marcellus is just, I mean, agree, disagree is not worth that much time. What I am saying well, actually, is, he is hold he's on, not, hold on, hold on, actually, he actually, is not it, to me. No, 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 but if I'm no, still no, no, entitled no, to my own opinion. I'm not speaking, I'm, <laughs> see, here's the difference. I'm not speaking specifically to Marcellus. Well, it's his commentary. I'm speaking to a whole bunch of people who think like yes. Marcellus, right. but we are articulating but, what he's saying, right. and somebody black has to be willing to challenge that yes. notion that that's blacker yes. when it's not. Yes, because you at least have to have that one little drop of blackness because we accept the nomenclature no, of our no, oppressors. No, 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 but if you're Rachel no, Dolezal, you're don't missing. tell me what I'm missing while no, I'm still, still trying to get it. a sentence out. <laughs> no, because yes, I'm not are. done talking. Rachel Dolezal, right? Wanted Lord, she's changed her not her name to Nakechi. She wanted to be Nikechi. black. Yes, she Jesus. did. God bless her soul. And she has even gone the typical way of the black welfare mom that she's not and gotten in trouble for welfare fraud. God bless her. But she wanted it so bad, and she was only trying to do good things for black people. And everybody, including some people who are right here in this room with me right now, had a real problem with this white she woman. Was stupid as hell. Not because she was fraud. She was dumb. Hell. No, because I, I think, her work was there, Roland. No, if she work didn't, no, hold up. Standard, First of all, hold up, hold up, hold up, stop right there. Hold uh, up, I'm going to take 60 no. seconds okay. real quick. Okay, do not nobody criticizing her because of her Nikechi. work. They were criticizing her for a fake-ass black person. But and she what I'm saying, the work. No, 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 no. And if she had just done the damn work as a white woman, no. she would have been fine. But here's she the point about black. Drop a black. Here's we the point about black. If you have any, I, what I am saying is that the issue is not 
What's your one drop, two drops, three drops? <laughs> she should. What, I, what I'm saying is, whatever, I don't care about Rachel Dozal. What I'm saying is this here. The fundamental issue that I have is when we are defining who's blacker based upon how, how so if I go, how broke were you? Oh, shit, that, re oh, no, that ain't really black because you were broker. How many rats and roaches y'all? Oh, y'all just had roaches. Shit, y'all had rats and yes, roaches. Bro. Oh hell, y'all blacker. Everybody, everybody shouldn't have to put up their pockets. No, and what I'm saying is, what, I, what I'm saying is, <laughs> when you define we blackness it all three times or right, right. who's it, blacker, because yes. you yes. were broke. That's dumb yes, as hell. That so, is. final comment. I think the goal here, right, that we're having this conversation, is to normalize blackness, right? We want blackness not to be an issue. And to your point. It is unfortunately an issue because of the legal and social constructs defined by white people, white supremacy, right? So we live in this context of what is black and what is not, right? And in the case of Rachel, unfortunately, under this construct that we she operate in, she did not make the grade. She Hence she why we got the criticism. The no, and so the goal, is, if his goal is to normalize blackness, well, we don't have these debates on who is black, what is black, right. who is blacker, then it really involves equity and fighting towards equality, and that involves all people, Here's whether what, you are black or not. That's all I want, right here. All of this, every experience that I went through the books, that's blackness. One is not blacker than the other. They're all the black experience. That's what we better wake up and recognize. Going to a break, we come back. Uh, black Women's Equal Pay Day, and also, what's up with a couple crazy ass cops? Next to Roller Martin Unfiltered. You want to support Roller Barge Unfiltered? Be sure to join our Bring the Funk fan club. Every dollar that you give to us supports our daily digital show. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real as Roller Martin Unfiltered. Support the Roller Martin Unfiltered daily digital show by going to rollermartinunfiltered.com. Our goal is to get 20,000 of our fans contributing 50 bucks each for the whole year. You can make this possible. rollermartinunfiltered.com. Life Lux Jazz is the experience of a lifetime delivering top-notch music in an upscale destination. The week-long event is held at the Omnia Day Club Los Cabos, which is nestled on the Sea of Cortez in the celebrity playground of Los Cabos, Mexico. This is also a black experience. The Life Lux Jazz experience offers the ultimate getaway for discerning jazz aficionados by pairing an upscale international destination with luxury accommodations, fine hot cuisine, top shelf libations, meaning liquor, breathtaking golf, exhilarating spa, health and wellness options, and much more while showcasing some of the biggest names in entertainment. The second annual Life Lux Jazz experience continues to build upon its success and heritage with jazzing around Los Cabos, a celebratory expansion of accomplishing its goal of sharing all the finest the destination has to offer, including daytime excursions and many concerts, including the Spirit of Jazz Gospel Brunch and Jazz Sunset Cruise. Confirmed guests, comedian actor Mark Curry, Gerald Albright, Alex Bunyong, Raul Madon, Incognito, Pieces of a Dream, Kirk Whalem, Average White Band, Donnie McClurkin, Shalea, Roy Ayers, Tom Brown, Ronnie Laws, and Ernest Quarles. Folks, I'll be broadcasting Roller Martin Unfiltered uh, from Los Cabos those two days. Go to lifeluxjazz.com, lifeluxjazz.com for more information. We'd love to see y'all there. Okay, this story was actually crazy. The Royal Oak, Michigan police are apologizing to Devin Myers for stopping him for allegedly looking at a white woman. All right. She's looking at me too. Kamiko, and I am in Royal Oak, Michigan. I was um, going to the CBS over here when this young man is stopped because a Caucasian lady said that he looked at her suspiciously and he has been pulled over walking to go to eat by two police officers for suspicion of being black and looking at the Caucasian woman. Well, a white woman called 911 and said he's an African American male. African American male. I don't know what his deal is, but it's making me not feel very comfortable. He's looking at me. Yeah, that's why we kneel. That's why we protest. That's why we fight because he could have ended up dead from looking. what she did. For 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 me, that is what this is all really about. The fact that in 2019 we are in the exact same place that could have been 1958 and 54. That's, that's Emmett Till. That's, 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 that's,
Or when you go to the lynching, lynching memorial, most of those people who were lynched, when you read the placards there, oh, he was leering at a white right. woman. Yes. Right. He spoke to a white woman. Mm -hmm. yes. One was one lynched because he said hello to a white woman. Right. Yes. It's, again, it's the same sort of narrative that plays out time and time again that we've seen, unfortunately. You know, I, I think that in some ways, black and oppressed and brown people should be doing the same thing. Whenever a person, non-white, whenever a white person looks at us awkward, we should call them. White person looking at me! Right, we should feel as if our life is threatening. Because there have been many times, Except I have been in the District be, of Columbia. I mean, and that's real. Right, where well, a white person has been staring at me, whether it's my hair, my sweater vest, my bow tie, or whatever the case is, and I've been almost threatened to call the police. And in some cases, I actually did. Particularly when the white nationalists came to D.C. to march. Probably. Uh, right. And so I it's called the police and said, I feel threatened. I'm 5'7 and a quarter. Yep. I'm 135 pounds. I feel threatened. And I think yep. we need to incorporate and do the same thing. Okay, tell me I feel threatened. Check this story out. Yeah, I know what time it is. I'm white. I got you, bro. Illegally selling water with our permit on my property. Well, it's not Moniz Galvez in Texas, but it is Dallas, Texas. Check out this white man at the post office, y'all. Yeah. Sir, really? No, it's not, ma'am. I'm, I'm a business officer. Really? This is not It's, it's not, it's not, it's not. It doesn't matter. Yes. They're it's playing a full time legitimately outrage. Well, you can be that way, but you don't. I don't care. Clearly. Clearly, dude. I don't care. Shut up. Man, wow. Give me the form, you fool. <laughs> yeah, can you send? Give me the form, you asshole. Wow. You fucking jigaboo. Ooh. Give me the fucking form. Oh. Can, can you send the police to Yeah. Can you send right Give me the form, you yeah, fucking nigger. Ooh. Oh, oh yeah. no. That's a good one. Can you hear a place, nigger? Ooh. Oh, wow. Now, I'm not quite sure if it, he has stuff on his belt. Don't know if he was carrying a gun. It's open to carry. Don't, don't know there, but... Uh... I mean, what do you say to that? This is America. Mental illness is real, okay? That man was not just having a white man. I, I, I don't think that's issue. mental illness. No, that really? Was, that's, no, that's, that's oh, you, you think you think that was a sane person who, because of their whiteness, ha was yes. doing yeah. all of that? Yeah, that's what it was. Yes. Okay. Yes. Just like the white man right. in Ohio. Exactly was. Just like the white man in Ohio. He, who he who, knows that's wrong to say. You don't okay. call somebody a jigaboo. That's a specific concept. I can't with y'all because no. if I was Absolutely. sitting on top of the hold up, hold up, crazy ass black people, you remember the white man? In Ohio, who had the uh, the, the uh, I think he was an electrician. Yes. Uh, and remember, he followed a black person home, and he was uh, giving them the finger and calling the N word. And then uh, a week later, I lost my business. I lost everything. You, uh, I mean, I'm sorry. Jigaboo, nigger, coon. You know those are offensive terms to people of color, particularly black people. Hey, that's not mental illness. Now he might have had a mental illness. How? Granted. How, how is it not mental illness to he say out loud what uh, you uh, know guess, better than? Uh, oh, I guess you yes. Are specifically targeting a group of people, a person rather. And that brother, I think, was African because he had an accent, right? Mm. So. <laughs> He wasn't even a regular black person. Uh, I did not say that. Certainly. Hey, there we go. <laughs> All right, y'all. I saw this video here, so I got a couple more. I saw this video here, and every white person should absolutely positively in fact i want all y'all to download yeah, this video and download. send this to all of your white <laughs> friends monique all of your colleagues should watch this video why did you call my name hi fellow white people are you having a sad because that family's enjoying a picnic in the park while being black did that customer in front of you just speak a language that makes you irrationally angry well this is a great time to try mind your own f***ing business with mind your own f***ing business you'll be able to grow the f*** up and act like a decent f***ing human being. Our patented technology allows you to pull your head out of your ass and see the world beyond the brim of your MAGA hat. Hi, honey. I saw some black people at the Starbucks today. Did you mind your own f***ing business? I sure f***ing did. <laughs> Stop bothering those nice people today with mind your own f***ing business. 
Side effects may include not harassing people, no one getting arrested or murdered by police, a general sense of well-being for people of color, a lack of internet fame, and or trolling and coexistence. Please consult your doctor if you are still a piece of shit after minding your own f***ing business, as the symptoms may be a result of a deeper problem and require further treatment. Now available at Anthropology and Whole Foods. Love it! <laughs> Love it! As Monique is giving you the side eye. I don't care. <laughs> Way to go, Cat Adele. Love it. Next time, y'all, run the one with no bleeps. Mind your own fucking business. That's a great product. So all of you, if you're looking for a Christmas gift for all of your white friends, give them this video as a gift. I think it's a great. All right, y'all. Power, season six, the final season, of course, uh, kicks off this Sunday. We were at Essence. We caught up with the black Benjamin Button, Lorenz Tate, and Rotimi. Here is our conversation. I'm glad Rotimi got his damn shirt on today. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm happy he got his shirt. I'm glad you pointed that out. Because you know what I'm saying? I had to make sure that when he got into the Sprinter van today, I said, put your, because he just had his jewels on and all his tattoos. I said, put on the shirt. And all, you know, he just said, all right, I'm going to throw this T-shirt on. And y'all, he didn't walk out and like unbutton his shit. Now he walked out all open and every damn thing. And I'm like, button that shit up. <laughs> You know, when you're butt scotch, you have to do it for the ladies, but yeah. I, uh -huh. you have to do it for the ladies. Yes, ladies. Uh -huh. right, right. <laughs> they, were, they were like, button that shit up. It's cold. Uh, yeah, it's going to catch a cold. That's how he does it, man. It's in the dead of winter. We're in New York filming. He steps out of the trailer with his, his whole, I'm like, what are you doing, man? Uh -huh. on. When you're a sexy Nigerian butt scotch, you make decisions that, you know, it's cool. I can't wait till Dre get killed. <laughs> I can't wait. <laughs> Listen, it's a great season that's coming up, season six. My man Ro is incredible. No one can play Drake quite like he has. He's been incredible in all of the cast members. I'm so happy to be a part of it. I think that this season is probably the best one because we'll be able to get a chance to see who people really are, what they're about, and get in their minds and go on the road with them. And all of the worlds are coming together. And it's a beautifully um, you know, crafted season. I'm so, I'm so happy. I'm just surrounded by legends. Oh, man, legendary. legendary. Oh, look who roll up. Look at well, look at all fly. Look at you. Oh, oh, cool. You know you cool. You know you cool. You no, 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 no They want to holler at you. Get over here. They want to holler at you. This is legend. How y'all doing? Look at all smooth and everything. Congratulations on the new movie. He's doing big things as well. Amen. It's so great to see you. Bless you, man. It is wonderful to be seen. Yes, yes, 100. <laughs> How you doing? Always good to see you, baby. Oh, always good to see you too. You still big pimping? Man, I'm so happy to see you on network television and scolding people and keeping them straight. Well, I, I, I just got an email. I'll be on ABC this week in two weeks, so I'll be bringing the funk. I'll be watching. I'll be watching. All, All right, right baby. Good to see you, All right, good seeing you. So, not only we got power, first of all, before I go there, more people want your ass killed than J.R. Ewing. <laughs> that I'm doing my job. He's doing his job. That I'm doing my job. You know, when, as an actor, man, when you can make people feel something, you've done something amazing. You know what I mean? He's been doing it for 25 years, so 30 years, yeah, 35 yeah, years, 30, yeah. 50 years. You don't age. <laughs> right, right. He's actually 75 years old. Like. <laughs> And, 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 and matter of fact, you done messed up, up so much, they want to kill your ass, too. That's how it goes, you know what I'm saying? Listen, I feel like this. Either you're going to love us or you hate us, yeah. one or the other, and I'm cool with it. Don't, don't have it in the middle. In the middle ain't it. So I'm happy to play one of the bad guys, man. And I got to say this. Thank you for doing what you were doing with the Frederick Douglass, the speeches that needed to be heard on 4th of July, the real deal from our perspective. So I appreciate you doing what you was doing, man. I appreciate it, my brother. I love. Season 6 Power. Y'all be sure to watch it. 8 p.m. this weekend. Check it out. All right, folks, uh, I told you that tomorrow uh, is Black Women uh, Equal Pay Day, uh, which is a critically important uh, day, of course. Now, now, how many people even know about that? Uh, so hopefully, uh, if you black, you will be, first, if you have the full black experience, Monique, uh, that you'll be actually celebrating that. Uh, and of course, there is the approximate day of black women must, it's, it's the approximate day which black women must work into the new year to make what white non-Hispanic men made at the end of the previous year, the 2019 Wage for wage gap for black women and men is 61 cents. Generally, right now is Jocelyn Fry, senior fellow at the Center for American Pro Pro Progress. Jocelyn, um, sorry to uh, come to you late, but this is so. When we talk about taking this long, so essentially, we got to go eight months into a year before mm -hmm. a black woman makes what a white man made last year. That's exactly right. Wow. Um, 
it's hard to believe, but I think it just really, um, you know, makes the point that black women are working at a significant pay disadvantage. And this year have to work almost eight full months into the year to equal what white men earned last year. And the real question is why? And we need to focus on that. Oftentimes when we talk about the pay gap, we just talk about the 80 cent gap, right? But that's the one that's familiar. That's the one that women have generally. But it's really important to talk about the fact that black women are even paid less. And if we wanna fix it, we actually have to be intentional about what the problem is and hone in on what are the strategies to fix it. And what we also are dealing with here is, look, even when you are a black woman who's a college graduate, what you're making compared to a high school person, high school graduate who is white, is a stark difference. Right, well, that's exactly right. And, and it, it defies the narrative that we often tell people that if you go to school, and improve your education, your wages will go up. And while that's generally true, it doesn't actually fix the gap. In fact, in some cases, it, it the gap gets larger. So while black women's wages go up, sure, it's, it's important to get additional education. It doesn't change the fact that you're still at a pay disadvantage when you're compared to your counterparts in college or graduate school um, uh, or even other forms of education. So we have to get at the fact that uh, even when, when folks are doing better and doing the hard work, they're still being paid um, at a disadvantage. What two things do you think should be done to change this? And who, who does it? Is it corporate America? Is it federal government? Who does it? Well, I think there's something for everybody to do. The first thing is that we clearly need to strengthen the law. Um, we need to make clear that, you know, if a black woman, for example, believes that she's being paid um, unfairly, not simply because she's a woman, not simply because she's black, but because she's a black woman, we ought to be clear that she can bring that, that claim and win. Um, there's some courts that recognize those claims, so there's some courts that don't. We ought to make sure that black women and any worker has access to basic pay information. They should know what the pay gap is, and they should know that pay gap broken down by race and ethnicity. Those are things that they can, we can mandate that employers do. But there are also legislative proposals that we can pass. There's also more that we can do around enforcement. The government um, pays millions of dollars to companies as federal contractors. They should be doing better oversight to really look at not simply pay disparities, but pay disparities experienced by black women. So there are a range of things that employers can do as well. All right, Jocelyn Fry, Senior Fellow at the Center for American Progress. We surely appreciate it. Thank you so very much. And folks, again, tomorrow is Black Women's Equal Pay Day. Thanks a lot. Thank you. All right, then. So, all right, folks, that's it for us today. We went a little long, but uh, blame it on Monique, okay? It was really There's her a fault. a black <laughs> woman named Kamala Harris who has a mending the pay gap plan as part of her proposals. It's yeah, I know, I know. I, 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 I know. Tomorrow's Black Women's Day, so that's the story <laughs> tomorrow. So can you allow us to have a show? I mean, we appreciate you want to you trying to be in today's show and right. tomorrow's show. Just want uh, but yeah, yeah, thank you so leave much. My, uh -huh. Leave my remarks. Is that, is that, leave your remarks? <laughs> yeah, like in Congress. Why don't well, you leave your, written, have the your written and revised remarks? Did she, huh? is, did she have the authentic black experience? Uh, she is that, half that, Jamaican. That, and is, she, is she truly speaking for black women? Right, right. Ah, that's a good point right there. We'll see. I say she's a black woman. What are y'all? She is. And I support. Oh, hell, we're not being covered that. That's the mother dumbass people who don't believe that. All right, y'all. <laughs> y'all want to support Roland Martin Unfiltered? Please go to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Every dollar you give, go to support this show to make this show possible. Please join our Bring the Funk fan club by giving via the Cash App Square and register. Uh, we, of course, have some great things lined up for you uh, over the year. We want to be able to cover this election like nobody else. And again, we speak to the black experience. And what is the black experience? all of it, which is what we do on this show. And so we want you to support what we do. This is independent. This ain't corporate owned. Uh, this is, of course, supported by our sponsors, our partners, and also you as well. And so we want you to make that happen. Uh, thank all of you who are watching, of course. Uh, last month, uh, my man told me we'd uh, exceeded more than 8 million views across all our platforms. And we launched this show September 4th of last year. About 170,000 YouTube subscribers. Uh, we now uh, passed 350,000. We doubled our subs in a year. And so we certainly appreciate all that you have done. All right, folks, I got to go. Also, let me say this here. 
So the shirt I have on, it was a one-woman play done at the Progressive National Baptist Convention uh, out of Atlanta. Uh, the Fannie Lou Hamer story it was an unbelievable production. And so uh, I, they gave me the shirt, so I told them I was going to wear it on the show. And so uh, that's why I'm wearing it. So if y'all see uh, the Fannie Lou Hamer uh, story coming to your town, you don't want to miss it. It's an unbelievable show, so please check it out. And I can't wait uh, till we see Fannie Lou Hamer on the big screen. I told you, Octavia Spencer, when I interviewed her for the James Brown movie, uh, Get On Up, said she would love to play Fannie Lou Hamer. And so uh, let's see actually what happens with that. All right, y'all, I got to go. I see y'all. Stay black. All the way black. Holla!